Welcome back to the channel, everybody. I am out here in Yakima, Washington, in a beautiful lapidary shop, and we are in Langford's Lapidary in, I guess we could say, north, the north side of Yakima, and we're going to be giving you a cool tour. This is a pretty interesting shop. There's a lot to see here, so we're going to walk around the retail space, and then we're going to go check out Robert's lineup of saws. Yeah, I think he had, I haven't seen these yet, but I have a strong feeling there's a very cool lineup of saws. I guess I know Robert's happy place. <laughs> Meet Robert and Lisa, co-owners here of this shop. And uh, is, is my assessment correct? We're north side of, of Yakima. Is that how we would describe this here? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I'm, not, I'm not super familiar with Yakima, so <laughs> I would say the middle of the north side. Yes, definitely. And uh, we have a big lineup of cases here. Can we look at some of, some of the stuff and then sure. maybe we'll, we'll chat about what you guys do here? Because one thing that you guys do, which is unique, you're not just importing stuff and selling it. Like you do a lot of custom made work of both stuff that what like people bring in as well as just kind of your own designs, right? A lot of local material that people bring. I uh, petrified wood, Ellensburg blues and that sort of thing. And we will take it from the ground right up to finished jewelry that they can wear. All right, so you're doing your own silversmithing? Oh yes, and goldsmithing. Uh, faceting, are you doing faceting? Yes. That's very cool. Can we see some of the stuff that you've, you've worked on? Sure, that would be over, over here. Over here. <laughs> Ooh, look at all this stuff. So I, I cut most every stone in, in this case. Mm -hmm. um, some of the faceted I did not. Here would be a great example of one I did in silver. That's a holly blue from Sweet Home, Oregon. That's very lovely with the little, the jersey on that. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Thank you. The ring? Yes. <laughs> of course, you gotta be wearing your own stuff. The bracelet with my favorite nice. dinosaur bone. And my bracelet. And what, what are those? That is holly blue with a garnet for my birthday. So apparently you guys, you guys really like the holly blue. I do, it's beautiful. Yeah. Well, you also, you have other, other, other blue stuff in here. The, you got some Ellensburg? Yes, <laughs> that's my Ellensburg blue section. Um, over here is the, like the pendants are just kind of random stuff that I thought I'd try cutting. Pinolith from Austria. Very nice. So what, what made you uh, kind of get started in the whole, the whole thing? Because I mean, these are all very like different hobbies for a lot of people. Like some people get into silversmithing and that's like the primary thing that they do. Other people will be just faceting, but you're kind of, you're kind of doing it all. What got me involved was I was a knife maker, a cutler, and I made high-end custom Damascus knives. And how else could I make them more pricey, more valuable? <laughs> and I wanted to add silver and gold and gemstones. And that led me to take some silversmithing lessons and Turned out I really like the silversmithing uh, way better than making knives. It was a much easier process, not quite as dangerous. Mm -hmm. And uh, when it came to setting stones, I found that commercial stones were a little usually odd shaped or the edges weren't quite right. So I took some lessons on how to cut stones. I ended up working for a, a lapidary here in town. And uh, I've noticed a trend of people that do lapidary, it's not usually the first kind of thing they started with. Like, you know, people will be uh, making cutting boards. They'll be doing some woodworking. They'll have done other kind of hobby craft type work and then they, they get into it. That seems really common. Yeah, I think so. I think people have that little crafty knack and then kind of leads them into the stones because it's a, a good way to make accents on mm -hmm. most everything. It, Stones pair with everything. <laughs> <laughs> they do. <laughs> well, yeah, there's so much to see here. What are, what are some of the other things that we have going on in your cases here? So in this next case, uh, we call it our estate case. So this is stuff that we've either bought from estate sales, um, things that we bought from rock stores that were closing. Um, and a few of it's just uh, things that have been bought just to resell in the store. And we've been carrying a lot of consignment um, pieces. We're really trying to support the local community, the local jewelers and stone cutters, trying to get them some, some show, some income coming in. So mm -hmm. in this case, we have a couple wire wrappers and 
the gentleman on, on this end, he cuts all his own stones and pretty, pretty prolific. He cuts stones almost every night. One thing that I, I noticed walking through here is almost everything already has a price tag on it, which is really something you don't see in a whole lot of shops. I feel like you go into some shops and people try to feel you out and they're like, well, I'm going to give you this price. But like, that's not really the case when yeah. you've already, you've already priced stuff out, which is, I mean, I, pr I prefer that. I think a lot of people find that to be a really nice. I believe so too. We kind of went back and forth on that topic. Uh, jewelry stores, they rarely show the price. You mm -hmm. have to ask someone and they come help you and get a feel for you. And where other places, uh, like rock shops in general, people want to touch the product. They don't want it locked up in a case where I have to go get help. They want to just be able to touch it and feel it and go, oh, that feels good in my hand. So we well, chose to show the price tags on as much stuff as was possible. Well, and the other reason was we talked about how many people hate to ask for prices. You don't want to stop somebody and ask for a price. and. At least I know I don't. Um, if there's not a price showing, a lot of times I'll just walk out and go, eh, I guess it wasn't for me. So uh, that was the other reason we wanted to show the prices and just kind of be very transparent with everybody of what. That's, I think that's really nice. That's not a thing that is common, which is unfortunate, but maybe, uh, maybe people will see this and uh, get, get the hint that that's the thing to do. Lots of pyrites. You got some thunder eggs down here. Yeah, this, we call this our local case, which um, Florida is not quite local, but um, we're trying to showcase a lot of the materials that are in our area. Mm -hmm. um, we have people coming in who are newbie rock hounds. They want to see what, what they can find in this area, what, what it looks like. Um, we have a lot of rough materials so we can show them what the crust looks like, what they're going to actually see out in the field. Um, this case was a lot fuller, but it seems to be a, a very popular one amongst people. Yeah, Biggs Jasper, that's fun. Yeah. I have some of the agatized coral from Florida. It's a consignment piece from one Very of our pretty. Members. Yeah, we've uh, gone out to the China Hollow Mine for the Biggs Jasper, and that mm. is cr crazy to see. Like, they're pulling like boulders, like ginormous, ginormous boulders of the stuff. So we have a few members in our rock club who back in the day were able to buy some of the blue bigs at a very great price and they've squirreled five gallon buckets away of it. And Do you want to plug the rock club a little bit? Sure. What's, what's the name of the club? Yakima Rock Club. Yakima rock As I almost drop our most expensive <laughs> piece I'll, I'll, of blue bigs. <laughs> I'm going to put some uh, contact info down below. So if you're in the Yakima area, people can go down to the club and... Yes. Start interacting with the local scene here. Do you do you happen to know how much it is? It's uh, I believe thirteen dollars a year. That's, that's so cheap. They uh, they do field trips where mm -hmm. they kind of guide you and you uh, caravan there and take your own car ride with someone else. And they're they're just, they're doing the monthly meetings again now. Yes, it's the third Friday of the month at seven o'clock, and uh, we can get you their contact info and they'll tell you where it's at and all cool. that. Cool. Uh, it'll be down below, everybody. <laughs> Let's see this thing. Oh my goodness! Oh my gosh! A beautiful piece. That's an, can, an amazing piece. You can see why they call it picture Jasper because yeah. it looks like a scene in the desert. It's like a, a, a sunset, like with the the purple there. Yeah. Very beautiful. If only there was more of that available. Yes. Um, well, what else do you have going on out here in the shop? I mean, you got, there's just piles and piles of material to look at. Well, and the other thing that I've been trying to do is bring in, right, bring in material that we don't have in the areas so mm -hmm. that people might not have seen. So we imported some great agate and the pieces were really, really large. And so we, um, Robert cut them down, polished the face of them. So it's fun for people to see. Actually, we get that question. What's inside? So now all of these polished faces, they can see what's inside of the grape agate. Yeah. Very beautiful. And then one of Robert's favorite faces, the fossils here. Yes, we've got <laughs> fossils. We've got a fossilized rhinoceros jawbone from Ohio. That's... Oh, nope, pull, does that pull? pull oh, yeah. Pull, pull harder? <laughs> That's awesome. One of the favorites at Christmas was the dino poo for yeah. people's stockings. <laughs> Just what it Very looks cool. like. And then 
moldavite and meteorites and faceted oh. moldavite. <laughs> Well, yes. Yeah. So, I mean, you have a little bit of everything. You have shark's tooth necklaces. Yeah. Guys love those. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Amethyst. I know. I know your 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 case here says items in this case not for sale. Yes, sir. That's kind of my private collection. Very pretty though. N nothing in there's worth a whole lot. It's just if I sold it for a hundred dollars, mm -hmm. I'd never find another one to replace it. So, I just. I've regretted selling some things because I just couldn't find another one. I gotta ask, you have Damascus ruby powder in there? It, 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 the... it, it, I got in a, at an estate sale. They had uh, Damascus ruby powder. And I just thought it was huh. neat. You'll notice I really don't have any rubies or diamonds or stuff like that, the really high-end stuff in the store. Mm -hmm. But now I've got uh, 10 carats of rubies or whatever that weight of that container was. But it's for polishing. Ruby is... Uh, is a corundum, just like sapphire, mm -hmm. nine most hard, so it is the second hardest substance that naturally occurs on the planet. Very cool, very cool. And you have some rough in here as well for people, rough and slabs, Yes. $3 slabs. So we got our start in the whole lapidary industry by, uh, well, Lisa started buying slabs off the Facebook auction sites and uh, started, you know, winning them. People would bid against you, the dollar <laughs> bid, and we bought an estate with a faceting machine, which I really wanted, and turns out there was a little rock saw there, a 10 inch, and soon she started bringing me rocks, hey, cut me a couple slabs, I'm gonna try <laughs> to sell them on the place where I've been buying them, and that's really how it all started. Now, we, she sells slabs every weekend uh, internationally. We've <laughs> sold up to 100 slabs a weekend. That's, that's a lot. Yeah. yeah, and it's mostly her work. I kind of try to hide out in the uh, shop and I'm just cut very, stuff. I'm, I can't wait to see the 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 uh, armada of saws that you're using. Well, uh, and, and our slab rack is yeah. pretty impressive too. <laughs> and you have uh, you have supplies as well. Yeah, I mean you have a bunch of stuff. Equipment for sale. Yeah, we got a vibratory tumbler, rotary tumbler, little gold sluice, mm -hmm. um, everything you'd need for tumbling uh, rocks or flat lapping. Uh, Polishes of all types, the, the finest polishes in the world. Can we talk about your polish? Sure. Your Owens? <laughs> we, okay, I, we have to talk a little bit about Owensburg Blues because, sure. you know, like you also have an XRF over there, which is something we're going to get to here shortly. But um, you do have a little bit of a reputation for kind of the Owens Blue, Owensburg Blue guy. I, I do, and I would say that's mostly due to the fact that I'm not far from Ellensburg. And uh, <laughs> the gentleman I used to work for lived right at the end of the uh, Ellensburg Canyon. Mm -hmm. So your know, choices were either stay in Ellensburg or take the canyon, come see uh, Andy Beeman was his name. And he taught me how to cut cabs and facet and taught me how to look at blues. Uh, my very first job for him was there was a big tin, uh, like a fruitcake tin from Christmas, full of blues, and my job was to stand there and just grind that reddish brown crust off and expose the blue so that the customer could kind of choose which one they wanted their jewelry made out of. So you have some experience with figuring out the best polish. Uh, yes. You, so I assume you've tried, you tried probably every, I have. everything. I, I mean, have. Like, cerium oxide is usually the go-to that I hear a lot of, a lot of different people using. <clears throat> Cerium is really good for glass uh, or like volcanic glass or obsidian and uh, stuff like that. Uh, a lot of the old rock hounds here in the club use a tin oxide or um, we got one guy that uses Tripoli and a lot of people think that it's maybe not quite as good as like the cerium or the tin oxide or whatnot. But he gets the best polish I've ever seen on tumbled rocks using a three-step method instead of four. So mm. it cuts down on the, the eight-week time. And uh, this is... Uh, Mostly his recipe. It's one of those old timer recipes. I said, did you make that up? He said, no, I read it in a book. <laughs> he told me the book, so I read it. And I oh, okay. And interesting side note with the Ellensburg Blue Agate Polish that I, I make. I was talking with a uh, chemical engineer who owns Minnesota Lapidary Supply. He makes a special polish for vibratory tumblers. And I said, what's in it? And he didn't want to tell me. He said it was proprietary. And I said, well, I have an XRF. I could uh, <laughs> just test it and find out. And he goes, all right. So we actually hit it off really well because my Ellensburg Blue Agate polish was ex almost exactly the same as his Rapid Polish number 61. 
So very cool. It's a sub micron, mm -hmm. uh, very small, about 0.3 micron uh, at its at its biggest, and it will produce a polish on any rock I've found. It is equivalent if it were sandpaper, it would be about sixty thousand grit. That's it's like a like a talcum powder. It's like so like baby. It looks soft in the package. Yes, and, and it doesn't look like you get very much, but that will last a long, long time. Mix a little water in with it and take a clean paintbrush and just dab I, I, it on your leather or your canvas I, I've pad. certainly made the mistake of buying too much polish. <laughs> so I have a big uh, homemade carpet wheel that I use for buffing uh, like large thunder eggs out. And I bought, I think, a 16 ounces of optical grade cerium oxide. I'm like, oh no, that's like, uh, like a 20 year supply for me. <laughs> like, it takes the most minuscule amount to like load the wheel. Yeah. So does, yeah, it, don't be, uh, you know, these little bags, like four ounces of something is gonna last. A long, uh, long, it lasts years. A long, it lasts a years. long time. I've, it, uh, over my 15 year career of cutting cabochons and polishing them, I don't think I've even used that much. That's, uh, and to, it, uh, it, a little goes a long to, way with it. To justify the price, the uh, the main ingredient in this is about $120 a pound. Yeah, people don't realize uh, the, the cost that goes into some of the some of the stuff. Yeah, it can be an expensive sport, but uh, rewarding mm -hmm. and fun. It's healthy to get out and go hunt for rocks. There's, there are no drawbacks. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, let's talk about this thing for a second, if you don't mind. Um, you uh, are the proud owner of an XRF gun. It's on loan. It's, it's on, on loan. loan from a very generous young lady that uh, worked for the company and had one of her own and said, I'm not using it right now and I think we want to see you do the testing. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, X-ray fluorescence. Yes, sir. And Unlike other analytical tools, the purpose of the XRF gun is it tells you the elemental makeup of whatever it is that you're scanning. So, yes. Uh, it doesn't necessarily provide uh, it interpretation will, it of it. It will not tell you what it is. It'll it will give you the elements that mm -hmm. are contained within the sample and how much of each element, the ratio. So in the, in the example here, which is something we're gonna be doing here shortly, uh, I have a piece of petrified wood from Saddle Mountain and a piece of petrified wood from Saddle Mountain that I found that's very, very blue. So we can scan them and that will tell us the elemental makeup of the two. We can see the, the, the differences. Yes. That, that's the basic Would subject. you like me to or you yeah, want to do uh, it? Yeah, yeah, let's see you do it. All right. Um, <clears throat> is my uh, lay person's exp explanation of XRF kind of spot on here or... Yep. I believe, something? <laughs> I, I believe you got it spot on because I'm a lay person myself. I, I'm not a scientist. I just play with a scientist's toy. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it beats licking rocks. In fact, you should not. Yeah. Don't lick. Yeah, don't, don't lick the rocks. <laughs> Bring it here and we'll XRF it. So maybe we could do that one first. Sure. Let's, uh, it, should be, it, should be still cl it should be clean. Well, you've touched it. Oh, that's so right. it, it could be, you know, we don't want to pick up. So you're just using little alcohol pads yes, to sir. clean whatever scanning surface? Yes. Uh, uh, it, it reads about 10 microns deep, about the depth of a fingerprint itself. Mm -hmm. And so we don't want to pick up your fingerprints. So we'll just give it a good quick I'll, wipe off. I'll, I'll clean the, Perfect. Other, the other one. Perfect. <laughs> and you'll want to get a nice blue area because you will get different readings, like say on an agate that has... So this a is a very colorful part. Versus this is the blue petrified wood from Saddle Mountain. So we have two pieces, and we can uh, see the see beautiful the difference piece. here. All right, I'm going to go ahead and set this on the device. It is an X-ray, so we probably will close the lid for safety purposes. And if our remote is up and working, I can go trigger pull, and man, we are sampling. It's amazing how fast this can do it. We have it set for a little longer test time, so it gives you a little better result, but it can scan as little as, I believe, two seconds. Just do a two second scan and give you a, a reasonable. This morning I looked at the manual for this exact uh, gun, and uh, they tell you not to hold anything. I wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> so let's see, okay. Um, it's still running, there we go. So. 
So a lot of XRFs, like you'll see some jewelers have them to identify precious metals. Mm -hmm. And that is the only programming that comes with them, meaning they will only identify the metals. Where for this type of uh, activity, you need the geochem program so that it will test for all elements. So uh, having seen this, what's your interpretation of that? Maybe. I see we've got SiO2, which is uh, silicon dioxide. Uh, one of the most prevalent elements on the planet is silicone. You've got some iron at 0.097%. So the majority, 99.9, well, 99.8% is uh, silicone. Iron, you've got some uh, nickel, some Cu is copper. And K is potassium, but they're in very minor. Yeah, I mean, uh, tiny, tiny fractional percentages. The, but I, I assume that that's enough to give the color to the petrified wood. Like the iron, I mean, it doesn't it, take much, right? Sure, sure. And when iron oxidizes, which you have, which is not just iron or Fe, you have Fe203. So like O220, mm -hmm. those all mean little subtle changes within the, the element itself. And... Uh, the 2O uh, would actually be an oxide, so iron oxide would be rust. So right. you'll notice a reddish, rusty brown color in a lot of rocks. And th this is a service that you guys offer. So if somebody can have yes. have something and bring it in and absolutely and scan. Something. Tell them exactly what is in the sample. Very cool. How much, is it, do you, how much does it cost? At, uh, so if you need a printout to where it is like, a, you know, like, a, like to assay your gold or mm -hmm. something like that, what is the gold content of this rock or a ring or whatnot? I will say the best sample is crushed, and most people don't want to take an Ellensburg Blue and crush it to get the best sample. There's not mm -hmm. really a need for that. Um, but if you need a printout so it's like official for insurance purposes or whatnot, mm -hmm. then it's going to run you $20. And uh, otherwise, I will probably just test it for free just to use the machine and add to the database. But bring interesting things in for him to scan. <laughs> yes, I will scan anything once just to see well, let's, what... Let's scan a piece of blue petrified wood now and we can see... Would see. you like to do it? Sure. Yeah, it, it, it's kind of fun. So you just... Uh, so your up. lens here is a clear area mm -hmm. and you'll just want to get as big a blue area as you can find on that rock over okay, the right, lens. Right there is where I cleaned it and it's good. And, well, you just pull the trigger? You can just pull the trigger or use the remote, which says trigger pull. Right Let's pull there. the trigger. All right. <laughs> there we go. Okay. <laughs> so we've been able to use this um, for a, diff a couple different things. We've had somebody bring in what they thought was a meteorite and mm -hmm. we were able to test that and get um, the elements done and then be able to send that into a university and Unfortunately, they told us not a meteorite, but I learned a lot and we've been able to test um, so rock samples for people that are up mining and they wanted to know what the gold content or copper content of their, of their rocks were. Um, but other than that, we've used it on gems, we've used it on slag glass, <laughs> pretty much anything people are bringing in and we're kind of curious what it is if we can't ID it visually. Mm -hmm. Well, it's also kind of uh, being non-destructive. Uh, if somebody came in with like gold jewelry as opposed to like scratching and doing the acid, you can yes. aim this at it. So how does that how does that work if you have, can it tell you like 18 karat, 20 karat, 16 karat gold, that type of thing? So carat is a content purity mm -hmm. and uh, 24 karat would be fine or 999% pure fine gold. Uh, 18 karat is 75% mm -hmm. and uh, 14 karat is 0.58 and then a long string of numbers. So about 58%, um, 10 karat is 42%. So I've tested what said they were 14 karat gold rings and they were right on the money 57.999%. Mm -hmm. okay. So they were... So you can use it for that. Yes. Yeah. Now it's not going to say that's 14 karat yeah. gold. You have to... Yeah, you have, to, you have to interpret the results yourself. And Speaking of results, so we scanned the blue petrified wood here. Show that to the camera. That's a beauty. Which uh, is, it's very blue, and we have some very different results here. So the other one was like 99% silicone, and we're at 84 here. Very interesting. Titanium and nickel, calcium, potassium. So, 
Very similar elements, mm -hmm. but slight differences and uh, ratios, meaning more percentage of one over the other, could be very well what caused the blue coloration. The only way to know for sure would be to do a lot of testing and gather the data and compare the data to itself and see what factors were similar and what were dissimilar. And that would eventually lead you to a, an answer if you did yeah. enough testing. Well, if anybody has any blue petrified wood from Saddle Mountain in Washington. Bring it to me because he thinks he's got the only piece or that maybe even someone salted the mine and planted you know, it. My one, the, the thing is with Saddle Mountain, people go up there. A lot of people go up there. And my fear is even though I physically dug that from the ground, did somebody put it there before me? Because, you know, we've gone places and we've been digging and you go down what you think is fresh and then you find a piece of garbage. And you're like, oh, no, people, people have been here. So I'm curious if that's a native thing or if somebody uh, left it. You never know. I tell you, if I found that wherever it was, I'd keep it. I wouldn't give it away or bury it in the ground. Yeah. Well, I mean, one thing that came up a long time ago in Spokane, which is where we're from, somebody dumped a bunch of septarian nodules from hmm. Utah in the Spokane River. And people were finding them and posting them on Facebook and being like, I, look what I found. Look what the Spokane River is producing. It's like... I don't know, people do weird things. I wouldn't throw my cemetery nodules away. Me either. <laughs> well, um, is there anything else up front here that we can we should look at? Lisa, do you have anything else you need to talk about that we haven't shown? Um, I would say probably the only thing is that we are always looking for used equipment. We have a list of people that they are wanting to get into the, the craft. They're looking for used equipment. We get it in and... It barely hits our shelves before we have somebody coming and picking it up. So always looking for that. Um, we always buy rock estates. Um, and we, we really like to support the local rock hound. And if they have extra material that they um, have way too much of that they've gone up and collected crystals and they want to just see if they can offload some, we could take a look at them and see what we could do and help them out. So are you doing equipment restoration then? Or are you just kind of like uh, buying, trying to buy stuff? Up. So we have a refurb guy um, that we can take all of our equipment to. So he's um, fixed up a few machines already for us and we flipped them that way and he's pretty good at it. <laughs> he's, he's an electrical engineer, by the way, and so anything mm -hmm. electrical is certainly in up his alley and even, uh, you know, basic mechanical stuff he's really good at. So. We are restoring, but we're having a, an outside guy do it. I, I, but he was, we met him because he was in here buying rocks. So he's a good guy for sure. Nice. And w w before we uh, go look at your saws and stuff, um, the best way for people to contact you or connect is probably over Facebook for like the hours and stuff here in the shop? Sure, sure. Langford Lapidary on Facebook is uh, the address. Um, but it'll have our phone number, address, our other, our website and such on it. And our website's langfordlapidary.com as well. So that's easy, easy to find. I'll put it all down below. Awesome. <laughs> can, we, can we go talk about some of your saws now? Sure. Awesome. Sure. All right. Wow. Well, so you do have quite the lineup of saws here. You have some material yeah. already cut and being washed in kitty litter which i do that it always you know it always feels a little weird to me when i'm like digging through <laughs> cat litter to find that last slab that's down at the bottom yes but luckily uh we have a good fence and we don't have any neighbor cats that yeah, like that's to good come over that's and, good that's good yes that's good. yes and uh material kind of just i mean it's like everywhere a, every every shop i've ever been to it's just material well you want easy around. access to it but uh yeah it, it where do you store rock I mean, I hate to just throw it on the ground, so I put it in mm -hmm. milk crates and buckets and then throw it on the ground. So let's talk about these saws a little bit. Is that, uh, what, a 10-inch? 10-inch, a star. Very nice. That was the very... That was a that was saw one number one? one? Included in the deal I made for a Facetron, a faceting machine, mm -hmm. and uh, the guy said, anything rock-related, I want you to take it, because I offered him a good fair price for it. And uh, so they got thrown in and I started cutting slabs for Lisa and she started posting them for sale on the Facebook auction groups. And we started selling slabs every weekend until it became full time <laughs> for me. And uh, yeah, 10 inch, that thing's made me thousands of dollars 
but also consumed a lot of my time. We've got a little lore tone here. 12 inch, and we picked that up last year at the Yakima Gem and Mineral Show. This year's show is uh, April 21st, 22nd, 23rd, mm -hmm. I believe, at the fairgrounds in the Modern Living Building. What do you think of the saws where it has that sumping tray in it? Well, I mean, do you have a, a people have some uh, strong opinions on those? We, my opinion is this one comes with a drain, the Highland Park. Yeah, so the Highland Park ones are similar. And so, for those that don't know, we have like a saw body here, and then there's like this tray below it, and that's what we're. It's full of mineral oil to start, and after you run one slice, you now have mineral oil with rock dust in mm -hmm. it, which is a uh, sludge. And if it gets on your clothes, you may as well just throw them away because it's not coming <laughs> out. Um, they're pro it's probably one of the messiest jobs. Uh, Mike Rowe from Dirty Jobs ought to come clean my saws for yeah, a day. You know, I would I, challenge him. I, I wish I could say I uh, have never sprayed myself with oil, but I have definitely opened up a running <clears throat> saw and it's like... You get a stripe yeah. <laughs> that goes from the ceiling all the way. If you're in the way, of course, you get the stripe as well. And uh, some of the newer saws have a shut off when you open the lid. The motor will shut off, and that's a good thing. None of mine have yeah, that. Yeah, and my saw doesn't have that either. I don't get myself too often, but it does happen. It, it's almost a guarantee you're going to have to do it at least once. Oh, you will. <laughs> yes, once. yes. You'll forget. So uh, the lower tone, you have two of the... Yeah. These are the High Tone 12s? Highland Park 14. Mm -hmm. uh, the new Highland Park. The old ones had a different vice set up. And uh, I, I love these. They're really reliable. Um, they work great. Uh, the old timers say, well, the old ones are better. No, well, okay, I get it. You know, so, so were the old classic cars maybe a little better yeah. than the new. But they all drive well. Um, so I really like these. Uh, I bought one and then and liked it so much. I thought, you know, I could double my output if I had two of them mm -hmm. and uh, got a big chunk of snowflake obsidian in that one. And it looks like an agate in the other. Very cool. Yeah, that was a large chunk oh, wow. of snowflake obsidian. Very nice. And I've been cutting on that thing for a couple of weeks. It just keeps giving me more slabs, and that's down to the last little bit. That's a beautiful piece. It's actually not my rock. I'm cutting it for a guy named Keith Ludeman. He's, uh, he was the founder of the Oak Harbor Rock mm -hmm. Club up in Oak Harbor. Uh, 56 <laughs> or 57 years ago, he started the first one, and he's... Slowed down a little, but he's still doing it, and he's a great rock guy and a great resource. If you can't, if you don't know what you have in your hand, send him a picture. He'll let you know. Let's, oh, well, yeah, lots, lots and lots of slabs sitting around. Yeah, this is a, about a week's worth. This and what's standing up in the kitty litter is about a week's worth of slabs for me. You know, because I, I have normal daily life, too. I have to make lunch and, you know, yeah. go, go to the store, and so I can't just sit out and cut slabs. Otherwise, I'm, I'd... I'm waiting for the, the time when we have a slab saw that retracts, feeds over, and continues cutting. Love that idea. I, I like that idea. Um, yeah. I, I may not be the person to make that, but it's, it's a fun idea, right? When I first saw a, one of the saws, the lapidary saw, I, I just assumed that's what they did. Yeah, no, these... Uh, yeah. Uh, one so, slab, and you got to go reset it. Yeah, if you've never seen one of these before, basically they're all the same in that there's an on and off switch, and when that chain reaches the end, it turns itself off. And then you have to come back, pull the, the vise back, feed it over, and start another one. So even though they're auto, they're not, it's not a hands-off thing. Like you gotta, be, you gotta babysit your saws. Oh yeah, you know, these two children play well by themselves. The rest absolutely need babysitting mm -hmm. or they'll quarrel with themselves or each other. And uh, you know, it, these two I'm comfortable leaving alone and just walking away. Yeah, Highland, but, Highland Park makes a good saw. I'll show you that re reset yeah, process yeah. if you'd like. Normally I wear a big rubber bib just mm -hmm. to keep my clothes safe. Don't spray yourself. <laughs> Make sure it's turned off a lot of yeah. them. The switch, if it's still in the on position, but the chain is just barely pulling uh -huh. it off. And as you, soon as you release the vise, you get that stripe yeah, we talked yeah, about. I've, uh, so I've done that, uh, I think, three times now. <laughs> Now to produce a, a seven millimeter slab, which is about standard what most people like for cutting uh, cabochons for jewelry, about that thickness. Mm -hmm. So I, I b believe on this saw I use nine turns and that's gonna move the vise over. And do you have a, are these all kind of feeding at the same? Speed no, they, they all uh, have different feed rates. Okay. 
So yeah, it's you, you get an ear for it. Mm -hmm. You know, even when I'm in the the studio, I hear w one drop, and I'm like, I think that was the 24, or I think <laughs> that was the 12, because they all have their unique sounds. And so, uh, like that 12, it feeds fast. I mean, it'll cover that much distance really, you know, in a matter of a couple of minutes. Mm -hmm. This one take quite a bit longer, but it probably leaves a smoother finish on the, on the you know the cut surface. Um, I, uh they all have different uh, slide rates on the vise as mm -hmm. well for m lateral movement. So if I want a seven millimeter slab on this one, I give it six turns. On this one, I give it nine. So you got to know your saws and you'll, you'll get used to it right off the bat if you were to get a rock saw. I, I, I've yeah. been running uh, those Agate Eater Greenline blades. I've, mm -hmm. I've been running one in my 14 with great surface finishes coming off of it. It should leave about a 220 grit finish. Yeah, I mean, you know, I've... I've had I have a couple of blades that didn't produce as high quality of a surface finish, but were more expensive actually. So, hmm. one know. thing I like about the Agadizers is uh, I, I did lose some of uh, these gold colored teeth. Yeah, they're replaceable. Yes, yes, and if you chip uh, any other type of blade, it's just got a chip out of it and mm -hmm. it won't work right, and it's pretty much done. These you just put a you buy the replacement strips, pound it in, and good to go. You want to hear it purr like, yeah, a, like, a, like a classic car? That's actually a pretty quiet motor. Not bad when you get all seven or eight of them roaring though, yeah. it can be <laughs> hard to hear things. But we won't leave that running for the whole interview though. I, yeah, I definitely <laughs> want to talk about your Hill Quest there because... I uh, have two of them. Yeah, uh, you know, the, the, the style in which the Hill Quest was made is not a thing you see anywhere. I know um, there's another company out of Texas that was producing them in this kind of, uh, like, I don't know, with the style of it. It's like a fiberglass top. It, it's a fiberglass like body. And one of the nice things is uh, saws all use oil, uh, the bigger saws mm -hmm. anyhow. This is tapered down, so it's using very little oil. Yeah. Maybe a gallon and a half, maybe two. Where, uh, and that's a 24 inch saw, where the 14s are using three gallons of oil. Mm -hmm. And the oil lasts for a, a shorter while in this because there's very little oil compared to how much rock sludge it, it makes. But you can uh, just it, drain it real easy and filter it and use it again or I, just I, add fresh. I like the idea of them because uh, it seems like at some point every old saw that I've ever came across or seen that's just like a welded carbon steel like body, like you develop leaks. These not so much, and and you can just patch it with fiberglass patch when it yeah, does. Yeah, you can tr you treat you treat your saw like a boat. Another good feature of these, you don't get the stripe; it goes sideways <laughs> when it, when you open the lid and it throws oil, <laughs> and it will do that because it's using a like a light switch. Mm -hmm. And if you just take a light switch and pull on it a little until the light goes out, mm -hmm. as soon as you let go of that, yeah, light you, comes you, back on. You just on. described my saw with a light switch. <laughs> yes, yes. So at least if this is gonna, you know, do something when you open the lid or pull on the uh, the vise, there it doesn't get you. It just gets all everything well, to the side. You you, you are a, mm -hmm. uh, a a lucky man for having <laughs> one of these twenty four inch hook hook quests. Yeah, I got that through an estate sale. Um, the guy wasn't dying. He was just downsizing and going to like an, a, a retirement place. And uh, so I got the saw and uh, all of his rock for a pretty good price. And, uh, you know, they cost money. But if you're not willing to put out the money, it's not a game for you. The one saw I'm not seeing out here is a drop saw. Have you I, have I you do thought, not have one. Have you thought of the drop saws at all? They, they I would do, love one. They do have a, a nice, um, like niche to them of like cutting thunder eggs and geodes for where you're just like lopping things in half yes uh the different types of saws they they all work better in a specific area you know to that saw and i would love to have one i just haven't had the opportunity to purchase one that was available well, maybe with this video maybe a, a drop saw is going to come your way <laughs> i hope so uh well one of our local guys he's a avid rock hound and he brought me a bunch of uh, red top blues and stuff that he'd found and geodes and stuff, all good stuff. And he said, Robert, I want you to sell this in your store. I said, okay, like consignment. He said, no, we need a sphere machine to make spheres. Hmm. I said, okay, so how do you want to work this? He goes, everything in mind you sell, put the money in a fund, any that, that you want to add, do so, and we'll get a sphere machine for uh, Langford Lapidary. He said, it, it'll be his, but we can keep it at my place. <laughs> Meaning he wants everyone to get the, to use it and enjoy it. So that's really cool. They start looking, uh, looking for that core drill to go along with it as well. Yes, <laughs> yes. 
A what, smaller version of the exact same thing. Wait, uh, is that a 18? 18 is an 18? 18 and a 16, I believe. Uh, the nice thing about the Hillquest is you could really run a 16 or an 18 inch blade in it. Yeah, do you have, you have enough, enough room? I believe the, so. You, yeah, well, you, yeah. You do have enough room in there to run a slightly bigger blade. I didn't know that about these. They're very cool, and you know, they're just kind of like the soft baby blue, like retro vibes that mm -hmm. you get. You get out of them, like very cool. Thank you. Do you have a favorite? Having oh cut, gosh, I mean, that's having like, cut on all of these is. I mean, there's got to be one that stands out, right? Well, it's like asking someone who their favorite kid is. You know, you like them all. The one that's not broken is your favorite. <laughs> yeah, the one that's running and not <laughs> making me fix it uh, all the time. Gosh. Uh, I like the Highland Park. Yeah. Which is a good saw. And uh, the only time it seems to break is when I do something wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but you do have a favorite vice. Well, now the, you see on the vices, the part that holds the rock. Mm -hmm. These Hillquists have kind of a unique design. Um, you lift this lever up and it slides into any one of those notches along the thing. And then as you twist that, this little piece comes out to clamp your rock. I don't really have rocks slip out of that uh, very often. Um, that design, that's a good one too. They're all good. It's hard to pick a favorite. I do like the, uh, the ones on the uh, Highland Park and the, the Laura Tone down there. They have their advantages and disadvantages. Uh, these can hold a, a huge rock because yeah. there's, no, there's, no, there's only a two-way constraint on it where the this style actually has you can only go so wide mm -hmm. and so tall due to the limitations of the uh, screw and so it is kind of limiting and you know you just got to run the right size rock through the right size saw i mean i think the answer is to have seven saws absolutely that's the answer or ten <laughs> i actually have a couple others I, I didn't bring them out today they're smaller what would be a trim saw these are slab saws yeah and a trim saw is usually for cutting the slabs that we saw and cutting them into the shape we want to make jewelry out mm -hmm. of. Do you have a pref do you have a preference? What's your, your your favorite trim saw? What do you got? what do you what do you got? We don't have to go look at them, but I'm curious. We we can go look at them. Um, uh, well, the one I use the most is the one I have, which is a trim saw attachment for my genie, which okay. is a cabochon cutting six wheel machine. Well, can we go look at your genie? Sure. Awesome. I like that you have a good you have a good organization here. It's uh, labeled, and that's about it. Nothing's alphabetical or anything like that. And you'll notice that some of the boxes, you're like, <laughs> why did she pair that with that? But um, it's usually based on how much material will fit into one single box. And this is the stuff that we sell online um, and a little Let bit for the store. Em. Let me show them. I'll get over here. Lots and lots of material. Yes. Dinosaur bone. Ooh, very nice. We have about 400 different types of rock here in the rack. It's double-sided. There's another side. What you see here is doubled on the other side. And there may not be any rhyme or reason to why uh, Moroccan agate is with chrysanthemum jasper, but I'll tell you, if you ask Lisa from the other room, hey, Lisa, where's, where's the Moroccan agate and chrysanthemum? Fourth shelf up, third row over. <laughs> And you just shake your head like, how does she know all that? I, I got, I gotta ask uh, after we look. What, what is this here? Chrysanthemum uh, oh. jasper and uh, Moroccan agate. Nice. Can we? Can I see? What's your galaxy rhyolite there? What is? Absolutely. What is that? Uh, Lisa, where is that? Right, right, right there. That one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we must put that back, or Lisa will. Uh, <laughs> she'll know we've been in here and touched the rocks. So Galaxy Rhyolite was a material they brought in from Mexico. Um, we got some a, a few years ago. The major flaw with it that um, we found as we were trying to slab it. Very crumbly. It, yeah, it hmm. had lots of fractures. And we talked to the person that imported it and he said, yeah, after spending one winter here, it just fractured the, I'll get out. So and that's I, the, the Jasper. Galaxy, or, the oh. Galaxy Rhyolite. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, the that is and that that's oh, like the porcelain yeah so this, this is the sci-fi or is exotic sci -fi. so mm -hmm. this is the other one that's in here this is the galaxy yeah. Rhyolite, and that was what just, yeah that's really interesting it's a beautiful material it just for, yeah it, it's unfortunate that oh well, like that it, just, <laughs> it just did not crumbles. just crumble yeah. did not make good slabs Please. so 
we didn't buy any more of it and I thought it was a great material. Just that is some uh, very, very beautiful Jasper. It sure is. Lovely. Lisa, what's your favorite out here? Yeah, oh, not even fair. Um, <laughs> Which kid do you like best? It really depends on, I think, the week. Um, <laughs> I kind of go through stages of what's my favorite, and I'll put more of it online for sale. But um, Which we are now, we used to only do Facebook uh, auction sites, mm -hmm. where now we've started our own at Langford Lapidary, and you can get that through our Facebook page, Langford Lapidary, or through our website, we'll link you there, I think, too. Yep. Yep. So weekend sales, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday? Yes. yes. Are you only shipping in America? No, I'm actually been shipping to Germany um, and to the UK, and uh, I guess that's it. Please tell me you have a map set up of like uh, all the places you've been shipping to. I don't, but um, I think that would be fun. Yeah. I, some of the customers that have been buying from us for years um, just recently realized, oh, you have a store, so next time I'm in that area, I'm going to stop in. And so I think it's going to be fun to start meeting some of those customers that I've built relationships with for the last few years. Get to know like what their favorite material is or what they're looking for. I get lots of requests of, hey, do you have this? And a lot of times I do. Um, sometimes I don't. It's like, oh, I want it too. So when you find it, <laughs> let me know. <laughs> I have a favorite. It's the uh, yes. Australian Tiger Iron. Oh my gosh. That is beautiful. That's very beautiful. We've been very fortunate with some of the estates we've purchased. Um, the old stock that's in them, um, we've been able to get it available for other people to use and get to see this old stock that's no longer available. So. Yeah. Well, you have uh, quite the assortment going on here of material for people to pick from. It's very lovely. It's hard to pick the slabs for the weekend of what I'm going to use, so I usually sit out here for a while going, hmm, how should I do it this weekend? <laughs> <laughs> this is the indoor workspace. I mean, I... I, I envy you slightly having uh, such a great workspace. It's far larger than what I have. It, it's actually not very large if you were to take the square footage. It's less than 12 wide and less than... Ha the shop is 24 by 24, but as you saw with the rock rack, that massive behemoth takes up a lot of space. And, you know, Lisa has her area for doing jewelry and such, so... I feel a little cramped, but that's just me. I'd love that everybody would love to have a bigger shop. Yeah. But I've really got it packed in tight. I've got uh, the drill set up for rock here with a uh, water. Got to have water. Bandsaw. What are you? What are you using the diamond bandsaw for? But cutting curves. Most like, like um, all the saws you saw out there cut straight lines. Yes. This cuts <laughs> curves. I, well, is there like a particular thing that you're like? I, th so okay, so I would say this is an uncommon tool in a lot of people's lapidary shops. Yes, um, but it's like a like a wood cutting bandsaw. So exactly. like odd odd curves, mm -hmm. insides, outsides, which are typically you'd be relegated to just grinding them out on a wheel, and depending on the diameter of your cab machine wheels, you're limited. Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, it'll cut either a convex or concave corners, and um, most, uh, say, cabochons, they're uh, round or an oval or whatnot, and you can cut that outside part just fine, but it, through a series of straight lines. Mm -hmm. But like on the inside curve, if you were to do the shape of like a crescent moon or something, that inside curve, oh, that's a tough one, even with the grinding wheels, trying to grind that out, mm -hmm. and uh, that'll cut it out just like as could be. I've heard from people... Uh, they're really easy to break belts or break the break the blades. Yes, it's it's a slow process using them. Am I correct? It actually goes surprisingly fast. I I think I have water in it. And if I do, I can okay. I can cut a rock real quick. Let me uh, let me find a slab. No, I, well let's okay. Well, let's get the let's get, get the me out here, here talking. I'm gonna fire it up and let's cut see stuff. A, a, you have a jeweler's workbench. Yes, jeweler bench and. Uh, Recent addition was the microscope. Very I, nice. I'm a, I'm a fan of the microscope. I had a repair I had to do that I just couldn't see all those little details. <laughs> and I, I called a buddy that's a goldsmith and he fixed it up better than it was brand new. I said, how'd you do that? He said, well, I can use a microscope so I could see. Uh, buffer, ultrasonic cleaner, steamer. Very nice. That gets all the buffer goo yeah. off. And yeah, and then we've got the, the Genie. So why did you go with the Genie? There's a lot of different options now for cab machines. There are. Um, 
basic difference between this and most cab machines is the little squirters these yeah little fountains that go in there yes and that keeps your wheel wet so you don't get the rock dust and you know breathe mm -hmm. it in and whatnot uh, most systems are a drip system meaning you take a five gallon bucket and you pour your water into a reservoir up top and then turn it on and let it drain and as it drains this reservoir fills then pretty soon you've got to drain that into another bucket take it outside mm -hmm. throw it away uh, this uh, just recirculates the water these don't actually pump water they pump air and the air is what shoots the water up on the wheel so it's a very simple uh, pump system it's actually a piece of leather a leather pad that just is moved up and down by a little like a pulley on a mm -hmm. cam and what, what grits are you running over here we've got 80 on one end uh, 180, 280, 600, 1200, and 3000 grit. Just like sandpaper, the same uh, grit. All, all Diamond Pacific wheels. I, yeah, yeah. The Nova wheels by Have Diamond. Have you tried other wheels? Yes. With no comparison. The, the, resp the, the response, uh, <laughs> uh, I, for, you, you, you're happy with those then. That's like, yes. For example, a gentleman approached me here at the store and wanted to cut cabochons for me. I said, okay, uh, let me see your work. And he went home and cut a few out of some material I gave him. And when he brought him back, I'm like, what? what's, what's wrong here? Why, why, why did you do this or that? And he goes, well, it's about what you can do with the machine that I have, he said. And I said, all right. And he kept consistently bringing them back and they just weren't done to what I felt was a good standard. Mm -hmm. So I said, come on out back. Let me show you how I do it. Maybe that'll help. And when we got done, he goes, you know, what you showed me was valuable. He said, but your wheels are are incredible compared to mine so he ordered a new set of wheels and that kind of corrected the issues he was having and i said hey can i can i try your old wheels just to see if it really was the wheels and it really was they hmm. just weren't a, they weren't as soft and squishy so your first two wheels generally are hard yeah hard hard diamond yeah so wheels either electroplated or centered and yes and then and you get after that soft ones. they get squishier and squishier and squishier otherwise you'd have like hard straight lines with corners where the squishiness is what allows it to uh it, to yeah, round it, out on like a cabochon yeah it even it evens it out so you yes. can kind of press in a little bit and you, it you want to press in quite so. a bit and that will is what rounds the, mm -hmm. the the hard edges so very cool yeah um so I, I love it this is the diamond pacific genie uh wouldn't have it any other way they're all good you know the cab king and all those they're, they're great but uh this i just don't have to pour five gallon buckets up top and then drain it out and all that i and uh, this also has a saw attachment that's uh, pretty easy. You just pull this off, pull the tray out, mm -hmm. unscrew that, and the other one just slides right on, and now you have a saw attached to it. They're quite ver they're versatile little machines. Yes, and very compact compared to uh, some of the older machines that were built into the table. Mm -hmm. It came with the table, and they were, you know, steel, so they were very heavy, hard to move. Uh, the six wheels used to be about that long and about that deep, and now uh, Diamond Pacific makes the Pixie, which is. That's a, yeah. That's a, is it their four the four inch wheels on five inch wheels on the Pixie? I believe so. Four yeah. inch, I think. These are six inch, and they do make the big one, the Titan, with eight mm -hmm. inch wheels. I wouldn't mind one of those. <laughs> I I don't have a whole lot of experience, uh, but on my two wheeled Arbor, I'm doing an eight inch uh, expandable drums, and it is kind of nice to have like the uh, big we big wheels are nice for big things. Sure, sure, absolutely. Um, and you have your the facetron, the facetron. Is for faceting. Facets are a series of flat angles versus mm -hmm. a curved, smooth dome, and uh, faceting is really paint by numbers. It's you hook your stone to what's called the dop. The dop is indexed with a flat edge. And your index, which is this numbered mm -hmm. wheel, it's got 96 on this index, so it's got 96 points that it can turn to and lock in. And so you're gonna cut your series of angles around using that. The angle of that you're grinding at is there and you just adjust that to whatever angle you want for that row of facets and it, it doesn't do the work for you it's all about do you press the same uh, pressure on each facet or if you go hard on one and lighter on the other even though this actually comes to a mechanical stop won't go any further yeah you, you can actually flex it with just the slightest bit of pressure it's a like any machine 
And so it's, a lot of it's just feel. Is that, has that been your only fasting machine? Yes, that's the only one I've ever had. It was uh, well used when I got it. It was like a demo model for hmm. um, a number of years. So I'm surprised it's still going, but it, it works for me. You know, I know there's better oh, probably I mean, out the there. Sky, the sky's the limit with a fasting machine. Oh now. gosh, you can get electronically digital pressure gauges and all, and, you know, the sky's the limit. The, there was a guy down in Tucson who's producing a new faceting machine and it's all carbon fiber. Oh wow. Which I mean, I he, it, it's one of those things where they don't list the price. So like, if you have to ask, you can't afford it. Right. But, uh, the, I, I mean, it looked super cool. And I mean, as Probably far as is. rigidity in some, in a machine, I mean, thick, uh, carbon fiber is hard to beat. So, yeah, I mean, but, make uh, fighter jets out of it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I would imagine it's definitely in the 10,000 range. I mean, full digital, mm. everything, precision machined, a giant slab of carbon fiber for the base. The Lamborghini yeah. of uh, faceting machines, yeah. Uh, I mean, it's it's fun to look at, but like very uh, impractical for most people. Well, uh, if you got as, one, as, I as would a, come as, use a, it. as opposed to, you know, more uh, entry, like, uh, was it? Ray, Ray Tech Shaw machines, Fastrons, more accessible to the average folk like sure, us that aren't, sure. uh, you know, dropping ten, twelve thousand dollars on fastening machines. But uh, you got to be a pretty serious player yeah. <laughs> in the industry to do that. I, I know several that are though. They've set out to become a, a career faceter, and mm. you know now they're traveling the country, going to different mines, uh, like the Sunstone Mine. So. I, I I don't know if you're ready to do this yet, but you did mention teaching at some point. Is well, this yes. The, would this be the, the teaching space for you when that uh, time happens? Or? Uh, this would be for like a one-on-one -on -one class. There's just no room in here. I taught for several years at our local makerspace, uh, silversmithing. I think I did seven or eight different silversmithing classes. I taught cabochon cutting on this machine. And I had to pack it down there, you know, load it in the pickup and haul it into the building and stuff. But we are uh, going to have a, uh, a building put up for class. So that, we'll, that's we'll, very nice. Basically, we could say we're having a classroom space built and uh, should accommodate at least six, eight students at a time. I want to come I want to come back and see that when that's done. You're welcome that, anytime. I, that, We'd that, love to have that, you that back. Would be, that, that, very cool. There's not enough services like that because... We haven't really talked about the price of things, but like a fastening machine, a cab machine, big saws, all of the supplies that come along with it, it can really be like an expensive hobby to just get into not knowing if you're really into it. So to be able to come and learn from somebody, like use the stuff is yeah, a very invaluable. desperately needed service out there. Could save you thousands. Yeah. Unfortunately, most people find they like it. So once they take the class, they're like, okay, now I got to get this, this, and this. And yeah, it can add up. I mean, uh, you can easily spend twenty five hundred dollars on a new cab machine. Oh yes. You can, uh, you know, try to find used saws, but like, if you're not in, if you're not super handy, restoring old saws is a problem for some people. So, you know, it. Yeah, and you know, the used market for machinery right now is uh, is really pretty scarce, just due to uh, supply chain issues. They say so. You might order a new saw now. And it might arrive in November. This mm -hmm. is March. I, I, They're I just waiting on the parts to arrive. And so it, a good used machine that's there in the store is almost mm -hmm. the same price as a, you know, a brand new one from the factory that they don't know when it'll ship. I know Covington Engineering down in Idaho, they're like five months out consistently on saws. Mm, I mean, yes. Uh, Highland Park, uh, I mean... Their big hang-up is shipping from China. So, like, you know, there's all kinds of things that could happen in that process that would slow My 14-inch, I ordered it in uh, June, and I got, arrived in November a few years back. Mm. But, yeah, that was quite a wait. Yeah. So, uh, the, it, it would be nice to have more spaces for people just to go, go do stuff. Yeah. So, w one of the things to go along with the classroom, if you've taken our classes specifically, not just any class, but if you take our classes, we'd like to be able to open it up for those that have gone through the process of taking our classes, kind of become a member, mm -hmm. and then uh, they would be able to come use it certain days and times of the week. That's exciting. And then that way, yeah. that way you're not invested the 2,500 in one of those or one of those mm -hmm. or whatnot. And you'd still be able to, for just a small monthly membership fee, you'd be able to come and cut your own capuchons or facet or whatnot. And, and that's, that would be here in Yakima, of course, right? Yeah, it'd be right here at Langford Lapidary. Very cool. 
Very cool. Well, as soon as that happens, as soon as you're ready, you have to send me an email. Okay. I want to I want to come see that. Absolutely. That's very awesome. Absolutely. Is there any other stuff out here in the shop? I see, I see that you have some silver smithing stuff. Uh yeah, just random stuff, a uh, shear for cutting it. This is a ring sizer, so it'll mm -hmm. stretch a ring out. This is a ring sizer and uh, this part up here stretches them out when you go like so. You'll see this part spread. Mm -hmm. And this part down here, if it's a wedding band, will actually shrink the band a little bit <laughs> by putting it in there and it just presses it down. And, and a rolling mill to roll out your, once you've got a lot of scrap silver, you can just melt it down in a crucible <laughs> and roll yourself some sheet and start all over again. Well, thank you so much for sure. showing your, your space here. This is, an, it's, it's very, very cool to see how other people work. There's so much to learn from just seeing other people's spaces, you know? You try to develop a kind of a flow to it, you know, I'll, I'll cut here, I'll clean it up a little bit, go here, do my soldering and my fabrication and stuff, and then to the store it goes, hopefully for sale. <laughs> yeah. Some are doozies and they don't make it there, they go back in the scrap pile or... You know, they're gifts for, you know, it's, mom, it's the an, sister. It's inevitable if you're a maker that, like, not everything's going to turn out flawless. Yeah, that never happens. Yeah. In fact, the gentleman that I worked for, uh, I met him in 2008. He got his stones in the Smithsonian Institute in 1974. I found the magazine article on hmm. it. And uh, he, he told me he'd never cut a perfect stone. And if there was anyone that could, it would have been him. He was so meticulous and so exacting and precise. So, you know, I, I strive for that, but I know you probably never will cut. the. It's like drawing a perfect circle freehand. It just, if you want to make perfect stuff, don't work with natural materials. Yeah, you know, yeah. Go get yourself like a CNC milling machine and only use, do things out of aluminum. Use the proper tools, <laughs> you know. We've developed tools and it's what, you know, got us out of the Stone Age, so... Tools are invaluable, yeah. you know, I love them. Is there any other stuff that we can see out here in the shop? Not okay. really, that's okay. about it. It's a pretty simple affair. Um, yeah, from here, they are, they come out of here. We start outside with a big rough rock. We cut it into a slab, it comes in here and we'll shape it with the trim saw or drill it or the band saw and whatever it takes to get it the right shape. And then we go over here to make a setting for it. And at that point it's ready for sale or gift or to wear mm -hmm. yourself. Thank you so much for opening up your shop, Absolutely. sharing it with all of us. You know, there's a, a lot, all of us, all of you out there. Thank you very much. It's always interesting for me to be able to see the way people are working, see your saws, all of the, all of the ins and outs of it, you know? It was a pleasure to have you here. Well, thank you. And thank I look you. forward to coming back and seeing the school when, when it's up and running. Yes. Thank you so much yes. for sharing your, your beautiful shop here with us. Great. Thank you for coming. Yes.